Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul had left Ephesus and traveled to Macedonia. He had stopped in Troas, but when Titus failed to show up, he continued on to Philippi, where he had a joyful reunion with his friends. Titus finally showed up with the encouraging news that the Corinthians had responded well to all of Paul's corrections. This was very important to Paul because Paul had founded the church in Corinth, and it was also the largest and most influential church in all of Greece. Paul's purpose for visiting all the churches in Macedonia and Achaia was to collect a large love offering that he and the others would take to the impoverished church in Jerusalem. This was to be a tangible, visible demonstration of the unifying love of the churches for their Christian brethren in Jerusalem. Paul very much wanted the church in Corinth to be represented in this offering. Each of the churches in Greece had appointed a representative to accompany Paul in his journey with this offering. They all considered it an honor to be represented in this lavish, generous offering. That's why Paul wanted to see the church in Corinth set in order spiritually. He wanted them to be able to fully participate, along with all the other Greek churches, in this honor of representing this love offering to the Jerusalem church. But the chaos, division, and disunity among the Corinthian believers was disqualifying them from this. How could they participate in a unified expression of love for others when they themselves were contentiously divided by pride, sectarianism, and disunity? Paul wasn't just interested in the Corinthians' financial contribution to this offering. He was really more concerned about their spiritual contribution. This is why he told them in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Any sacrificial financial offering by the Corinthians would have been meaningless if it were not offered in an authentic expression of heartfelt love. This is why Paul was so concerned that the Corinthian believers get their spiritual house in order before he came. Recall that earlier, prior to Paul's departure from Ephesus, Paul had sent his ministry associates, Timothy and Erastus, ahead of him into Macedonia to prepare all the churches there for this collection for the Jerusalem church. Timothy was one of Paul's closest and most trusted ministry associates. And through Timothy's work with Paul, Timothy was already very well known to all of the churches. Erastus was a member of the Church of Corinth and was a very well-respected public official as he served as the treasurer for the city of Corinth. This made Erastus an ideal choice as one of the key leaders to help coordinate and administer this large financial collection from all the churches. Paul met Titus, Timothy, and Erastus once he arrived in Macedonia. Upon hearing Titus' encouraging report from Corinth, Paul then wrote the letter of 2 Corinthians from Macedonia, informing the Corinthians that he was sending Titus ahead of him to Corinth to prepare for this collection, along with two others, whom we can deduce were Timothy and Erastus. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, But thanks be to God, who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself, and to show your ready mind, avoiding this, that anyone should blame us in this lavish gift which is administered by us, providing honorable things not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have often proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent because of the great confidence which he has in you. If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. Or, if our brethren are inquired about, they are the messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Therefore, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. We learn earlier from Acts chapter 19, verse 22, that Paul had previously sent Timothy and Erastus ahead of him into Macedonia to prepare for the collection of this offering. Even though here in 2 Corinthians, Paul doesn't expressly name Timothy or Erastus, their identity can be deduced from the passage. Timothy, the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches, 
was one of the seven chosen by the churches to travel with Paul's team, representing this love gift. Paul explains in chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians that he wasn't yet sending any Macedonian team members along with Titus down to Corinth because he didn't want the Corinthian church to be embarrassed if any of the Macedonian brothers should find the Corinthian church spiritually unprepared. Paul reminds the Corinthians that they had been very zealous about this love offering a year prior, and their zeal had actually stirred up the majority of the other believers in Macedonia. Now, a full year later, the Macedonian churches had already prepared lavishly with this love offering, but the Corinthians, by contrast, weren't ready because of all the division and disunity in their midst. Paul didn't want the Corinthians to appear less ready than their Macedonian counterparts, so he sent Timothy, who was from Asia Minor and not from Macedonia, and he sent Erastus, who was one of their own. As a member of the church of Corinth, Erastus had great confidence in the Corinthian believers, and so he had labored more diligently on behalf of his Corinthian friends. Timothy and Erastus were the logical choices to accompany Titus, as it was already their assigned task to prepare all the churches for this love gift. Paul sent this delegation to Corinth along with his letter of 2 Corinthians. Paul told them in his letter that he wasn't forcing the Corinthians to participate in this offering, even though they had promised to do so a year prior. Instead, Paul plainly told them, I speak not by commandment, but I'm testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. Paul makes no apology in giving the Corinthians some healthy pressure by reminding them of how beautifully generous the Macedonian churches had prepared to contribute to this lavish offering of love. Would the Corinthians rise to the challenge? Paul tells them plainly, I am testing the sincerity of your love. We can learn several lessons through all of this. First, love is to be the motivating factor in everything that we do. Paul points this out when he writes, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Self-sacrificing actions may benefit others, but without a heart of love, it does the giver no good. What's the point of showing generosity to others if it's done grudgingly or out of compulsion? Then the selfless deed is not done in love, but for some ulterior motive. Jesus likewise said that the Pharisees did good deeds, not out of a motive of love, but out of a motive to be seen by others and to be perceived as more spiritual. Jesus said that such people have already received their reward and therefore will have no reward from God. We need to realize and remember that love is its own reward. This is because love itself has real intrinsic value in itself. Loving acts of generosity should never be done with an ulterior, self-serving motive, because that's the opposite of love. That was the point of Paul's lavish offering for the impoverished church in Jerusalem, not merely to meet their financial needs, but more importantly, as an authentic expression of genuine, heartfelt love. Secondly, we can see that our faith will oftentimes be tested. Paul plainly admits, I am testing the sincerity of your love. Contrary to those who claim that faith is solely a private affair, Jesus taught that every tree is known by its fruit. James likewise teaches that faith without works is dead. James reminds believers that the testing of your faith produces patience. God tests the faith of believers, not to condemn us or to embarrass us for our shortcomings, but rather to produce a consistent steadfastness of faith. God tests us to strengthen us. Let's allow God to strengthen our faith. Let's allow the love of Jesus to be proved out in our everyday experience as we seek opportunities to tangibly demonstrate the life-changing grace of the love of God in Christ. Mm -hmm.